Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are going to take just a few minutes to let people filter in, and then we will try to get uh, started here in, in just a minute. All right, well, it is just about um, five past the hour here. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and get things started. Uh, welcome to the Watershed Advisory Committee meeting for the Cuyahoga River North um, Watershed Advisory Committee. Um, we are happy to have you here today and we're glad you could all join us virtually. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide there. Great, okay, so this is the agenda. Um, as many of you know, my name is Donna Friedman. I'm the watershed team leader for the sewer district for the Cuyahoga River North group. Um, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping for Zoom right now. Um, questions, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put those in the chat and Keith McClintock, manager of watershed programs will be monitoring that. Um, we will also be posting this presentation on the district's website but in the meantime, if you need any specific slides, you're welcome to email um, me or your watershed team leader um, to get those. Um, thank you to Joyce uh, for sending out the information sheets today. If you did not get your information sheet with your community cost share uh, info on it, please let us know in the chat so that we can make sure um, it gets to you shortly. And lastly, thank you to John Gonzalez for working behind the scenes today and helping us out with this presentation. Um, this is the agenda that we'll be going off of today. Um, we'll be hopefully getting you out of here at 3.30. And with that, I will hand it over to Frank Greenland, Director of Watershed Programs for some highlights. Okay, I want to uh, thank everyone for attending. This is our first Watershed Advisory Committee in the fall of 21. We've got a good presentation today. I, I just want to highlight a couple items. Um, you're going to hear from Justin Tallop, who's in our water quality and industrial surveillance group, about a pretty neat project on Plum Creek with that involves fish uh, relocation, translocation to Plum Creek and it's, it's a really neat effort and it was his idea to, to pull this one off. And I think it's great work. Um, George Remus is gonna talk today about the work he's doing to try and refine and expand our regional stormwater models to start looking deeper into um, solving local problems, local stormwater related problems. And I think as we advance the program, I urge the communities to take advantage of this opportunity. We can help refine and work on some of your local prob problems. You have community cost share money. I, in any given instance, we'll have to decide, you know, who's paying for what and what's the cost. But we really want to get into these discussions because it's of great use to, to, to the local communities as well as us. So George's presentation will highlight that. Not stormwater related, but member community infrastructure program, we've awarded 15 million in grants this year. Um, that will hopefully hold for the next five years in our, our 2022 through 2026 rate hikes that the, the board adopted this year. Uh, each year there should be 15 million uh, for that member community infrastructure program. And I urge you to take advantage of that opportunity. Lastly, I just wanted to mention that for the 2022 through 26 uh, period, 
the board has adopted a, a wastewater rate stormwater fee increase of about it's 4.2 percent annually so those stormwater tier two monthly fees that are now 515 go up to 537 next year fairly nominal but it does give us a little bit more breathing room to allow us to do more construction design and construction projects you'll hear about the master planning effort we're about done with four big time master plans. I think the total to get to a hundred year level of protection, which is very difficult in certain areas is over $1 billion. So significant need, the rate hike helps us uh, execute more projects. And that's really all I have. I really urge people to ask questions today. Um, so that's not a one-way discussion. Ask whatever questions you've got about our program, we'd be happy to answer them. And I'll turn it back to Don and out for the rest of the show. Thanks, Frank. Appreciate that. Um, so our next topic will be um, Community Cost Share 2021. Uh, if you wanna hit the slide there, John. There we go. All right, so almost 31 million um, has been sent, spent since the initiation of the stormwater program and there's about 22 million in the hopper um, to be spent. So if you're having trouble finding ways to utilize your community cost share funds, you're welcome to reach out to your watershed team leader. We can help run through some projects for you um, that would be applicable. Uh, some popular uses are catch basin repair, leaf pickup or um, winter salt storage. Another note on community cost share, we are hoping to launch a live dashboard for communities to view their individual balances um, so that you won't have to reach out to your watershed team leader, although you're always welcome to um, in order to get that information. Um, next up, we have the local sewer system evaluation studies diving deep uh, just briefly into the wastewater side of things. Um, so these, uh, our LSSES studies are, are coming to a close across the board. Um, so we're working on reviewing the final community reports now. We will uh, be sending those to you if you haven't gotten yours yet, um, especially for the CVI and the, um, the Southwest Interceptor areas. Um, we're going to be reaching out to you after we send those reports to set up a meeting um, and we can go through those problem areas with you if that would be helpful. Um, and then just a, a brief note on MCIP, you know, uh, those applications will be due in May and these reports from the SSES are a great way to really launch into one of those applications and try to get money. There is design, um, design only uh, applications and then there's also design and construction. So if you don't feel like you're gonna be ready to really um, finish a project too quickly and you need time to design it, we have that option available for you as well. And then the next update, this is going to, these are, the next couple slides are going to be about the stormwater fee credit policy manual. So um, we are working on some updates, um, and this is to make you aware of those updates. So this first slide here um, is, uh, is about the quantity credit applied in very specific situations. Um, in this case, they're showing you an HOA on this slide. Um, so previously, if an area did not drain to a stormwater control measure, for example, in this very large HOA, the, the properties that are in this red outline um, did not drain to the stormwater control measure. And so they weren't deemed eligible for a credit, even though those HOA members were paying into the maintenance um, of that stormwater basin over there in the, in the blue on the right-hand side of the slide. So in this update, um, we're gonna be changing that so that those sublots uh, would be eligible for that credit as long as the stormwater practice was built and designed to manage um, that area. So even if that area doesn't drain to it, if it was built to capture that additional drainage um, for those sublots, then we will accept that and allow those residents to have credits. All right, this next one. So we currently have an industrial NPDES quality credit that allows companies, industries to get 25% for complying with their permit requirements. We're gonna be sort of copying that format, that credit format to um, service municipalities that have an MS4 NPDES permit. 
So in most cases, public buildings uh, like city hall or like service yards are exempt from the fee. Um, but in a few situations, municipal parcels may be self-sustaining um, and those are billed. So if you have any municipal, municipal parcels that you know you're being billed for, um, this charge or this would allow you to apply for um, a 25% credit, quality credit, um, for staying in compliance with your MS4. Uh, and if you need more information on that, you can um, give Chris Hartman a call at our offices. And then lastly on this, um, here are just a couple more points. So bullet point three, um, credit eligibility re will require an applicant to have at least uh, partial maintenance responsibilities for an SEM. This originally said that they would be solely responsible for maintenance on an SEM. So um, now we're just saying that the, the applicant has to have some buy-in. They don't have to have you know, total and complete uh, responsibility. Number four here uh, is really related to our green infrastructure grant program. It helps to sort of um, combine the paperwork that's needed for that grant program and, and for this credit application sort of makes it into one process. And then bullet point five here um, is to allow people to complete inspections during months when there is less snow on the ground because we were having some renewals come up um, in November, December and nobody wants to do an SCM uh, review inspection. In, in those months. So this will make it a little bit easier in order to do those in the spring or in the summer. The report of flood tool, I know we talked about this a little bit at the last WAC meeting. Um, this tool is specifically for communities to log in their flooding data. This can be surface flooding data. It can be basement, basement backup flooding data. Um, it's a very easy to use tool. We also have a paper format. We have an Excel format any kind of format you need, we'll get it to you. We really just wanna start getting some data put into this tool. I think right now we have about 300 entries um, and this data is exportable. So once you put it in, if you wanna apply for an MCIP project um, and you know that the area is flooding and that you've logged a bunch of flooding data into our raft tool here, um, we can help you export that data and you can then attach that to your MCIP application or any other applications that you might be going for when it comes to um, funding for these large capital improvement projects. And then uh, in other news, we'd like to share with you, we have some new Fall Fresh styles here. And by that, I mean, we did some rebranding. So on this slide, you'll see our new font um, and our cute new district blue color here, um, which goes great on all of our latest flyers and our cost savings handout. For dark, uh, dark backgrounds, we'll be using this white logo that you see here. And then for light backgrounds, we'll be using this logo. Um, if you need anything updated that for some reason has our logo on it um, and you'd like to update it with the new logo, you're welcome to send that over to us and we can get that updated for you. Um, and then if, in case you're not sure who your watershed team leader is, um, or if you'd like to find a new one after this WAC, uh, you're welcome to use this map as a resource. Um, it has, it's updated with our new branding um, and it has all the communities with who is responsible for them at the sewer district. Are there any questions in the chat, John or, or Keith? We're all clear now, Donna, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Justin Tellup. He's our Environmental Compliance Inspector 2 uh, for our future presentation about fish. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Donna. Uh, you can go to the next slide, John. So I'm giving, gonna give you guys an overview of a project we're doing to kind of do a biological recovery in Plum Creek. So we're gonna translocate fish from the Rocky River watershed up into Plum Creek to try to get that water body back into attainment. Just some background on Plum Creek. So it's a headwater stream tributary to the west branch of the Rocky River. Uh, drains about three and a half square miles, flows through Brunswick, uh, Columbia Station, Olmstead Town, Township, and enters into the west branch of the Rocky River right there at Olmstead Falls. A few of the interesting watershed characteristics of it, uh, it drains 18 square miles, so it's a pretty large headwater stream, which cutoff is at 20 square miles. And it's 27% forested, 
and the important number there would be the 4% impervious surface, which we don't see too much within our service area. So that's a good sign. So the way Ohio EPA conducts their water quality standards is completely a biological approach. And by what that means is they're looking at the fish and the macroinvertebrates, and those are the two metrics that they determine whether water bodies and water quality standards attainment or not. So for the fish metric, they use an index of biotic integrity or the IBI metric, which has 12 different metrics and gives you a total score. And same thing with the macroinvertebrates, those are the aquatic bugs that live in the water. Uh, and that's measured with the ICI or the Invertebrate Community Index. When we do a bioassessment, we also take the physical parameters and the chemical parameters of the water body just to make sure the habitat's suitable for the fish to live in and the water quality is good enough for the fish and bugs to live in as well. The table here on the right shows historical data from Ohio EPA and ourselves in the environmental assessment section and shows that Plump Creek has been a non-attainment for their water quality standards every single time dating back to 1981. So prior to the 90s, uh, it was listed as impaired due to gross organic enrichment, would be, which would be poor wastewater treatment, poor chemical water quality. And then moving forward into the 2000s, it was listed as having nutrient enrichment. So it's enriched with nutrient, algae, and whatnot. And then the most recent one, the Ohio EPA did their bioassessment in 2014, listed it solely as natural sources. So how did we get from that gross organic enrichment, poor water chemistry to basically no water quality issues at all? Well, in 1983, we started to plan for our Southwest Interceptor expansion which the Southwest Interceptor is a very large trunk sewer, sanitary sewer that collects all the local system that the cities discharge. So when the Southwest Interceptor went online back in 1997, it redirected flows from the Brentwood, Western Ohio Utility, and ODOT Park 339 wastewater treatment plants, which were tributary to Plum Creek. And that right there eliminated over half a million gallons a day of wastewater, which was really poorly treated to Plum Creek. So currently there's only one wastewater plant, the Plum Creek plant, which is very small average design flow of 0 0.04 million gallons a day. And that took care of the organic enrichment portion that was impaired. Moving on to the nutrient enrichment, that was mostly Ohio EPA's job during that. They listed it as impaired based on nutrients. They developed the total maximum daily load in 2001 just for Plum Creek. And then that, what that did is it put uh, restrictions on what that Plum Creek wastewater plant could discharge in terms of nutrients. And actually in 2019 and 2020, our monitoring at the district has demonstrated that the creek is now meeting all of its criteria that's outlined in that TMDL. So the Rocky River has come a long way in terms of biological recovery and water quality as an overall. Back in 1981, their assessment shows a lot of red, which would be fully impaired uh, based on the biological criteria. So you have the whole main stem of the Rocky, a lot of their tributaries on the northern end are red, yellow would be partial attainment, which means either the bugs or the macroinvertebrates or the fish are meeting, but not both. And then moving into 1997, the figure in the center there, you're still really not seeing much of that recovery on the Rocky River those wastewater treatment plants are just being taken offline and you're not gonna see a recovery right away. The figure on the right here shows uh, what the Rocky River looked like in 2014 and 2015. And it shows almost a complete recovery of the Rocky River main stem, the West Branch and the East Branch. So when the Southwest Interceptor went online in 97, it took more than just those three wastewater plants offline. We took the Brook Park, Middleburg Heights, and a total of nine wastewater treatment plants were taken offline and now discharging to the Southwest Interceptor out of the watershed. So when we look at the two components, the macroinvertebrates we'll start with here. These are the aquatic bugs that live in the river. When you're looking at overall health of the stream, they're really good indicators. So the top left figure will show total taxa per year. So we're seeing more biodiversity within the stream, which is good. The bottom left table will show your sensitive taxa, which can't live in polluted streams, which we're seeing a lot more of them per year, especially after 1997. 
And then your figure on the right shows your EPT tech. So that's what EPA classifies as a sensitive group. So those are your mayflies, your caddisflies, and sensitive groups of bugs. And actually, five of the last, last six assessments dating back to 2014 have shown that the macroinvertebrate community is in attainment of their, their component for the water quality standards. And they can, they can move upstream if there's a physical barrier. These bugs spend most of their life in the aquatic environment, but they'll hatch like we see on Lake Erie, the mayfly hatch, the midge hatch. They'll fly around and then they'll recolonize another section of stream, which they can, if the water quality is good, then they will, they'll ref reflect that with the, with the biodiversity in the stream. Now looking at the fish community metric, the second half, it really hasn't shown any recovery. When they had them wastewater treatment plants there, they were poorly treated wastewater, and it basically wiped out the fish and the bug community in the stream. The top left chart here shows poor to very poor community scores in every assessment back to 81. And when you have an impaired stream based on fish, your fish metric, it could be due to a number of things. We've ruled out water chemistry of that table. Uh, the bottom left chart shows good to excellent fish habitat, which would be the other metric. You're not going to have a real diverse community of fish in a stream that's just a concrete channel. So we have good habitat. And then the table on the right here, it really summarizes uh, what's going on with Plum Creek. This shows all the scores from the Rocky River West Branch and streams less than 20 square mile drainage. The blue would be streams that don't have any fish barrier, waterfall, uh, dam that's blocking fish migration upstream. And five of the six impaired sites, which you see in red, are upstream of fish barriers. So this is the fish barrier, the natural barrier that we're seeing on Plum Creek. This is right in downtown Olmstead Falls, right where it enters into the west branch of the Rocky River. A fish that's two to five inches long is not going to be able to swim up that. That's just too, too much of a task for them. So Ohio EPA has ruled out all the other options, and it's due to natural causes why the fish can't get back up there. So since they did that uh, in their 2014 report, they're saying that the Plum Creek is potentially or potentially eligible for an aquatic life use redesignation to a lower water quality goal. So if they do that, it'll lower water quality protection for Plum Creek, specifically dissolved oxygen standards and habitat goals. Hey, Justin. Um, other streams in the service area are out of attainment. So why would the EPA propose that here for Plum Creek and not for other streams that we have in the region? Yeah, good question. Uh, this is really the first stream that I've seen them recommend this for. Uh, Plum Creek has documented improvement to water chemistry. It's gone through the organic enrichment, the nutrient enrichment, those are cleaned up. And more importantly, the macroinvertebrates are back to being in attainment, they're meeting their standard. So if the macroinvertebrates are, are meeting the standard and the water chemistry is good, and they clearly show that this, this physical barrier here is blocking fish migration, that's the last link for a full biological recovery. And other streams in the service area, you know, they have other problems with water chemistry or habitat. So Plum Creek's kind of a unique stream in that term. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. So that 2014 report that I was talking about actually came out in 2020 from Ohio EPA. So what Ohio EPA recommended to how to handle this biological recovery was a seeding of Upper Plum Creek with a representative collection of headwater fish species from adjacent waters within the basin should be considered. And if Whoever picks this project up is successful. It will contribute to the aquatic life use restoration and eliminate the need to actually lower its water quality goal. So when we read that, we kind of figured, let's try to make this happen. And we aligned it well with our water quality and resource management focus area and our strategic plan. This is a really good opportunity uh, to drive water quality protection and enhancement for the region, especially in Plum Creek. So we've already identified and solved numerous of the water quality issues. We're continuing to do that. As Donna mentioned earlier, we have the Southwest Interceptor Local Sewer System Evaluation Study coming out soon. It's really just the free fish migration that's hindering its potential to achieve that full biological attainment. So now we have an idea for a project. Now we have to come up with our plan. So we're starting with our species selection. We selected nine 
fish, which these are all minnows and darters basically. So their max size is really only gonna be five to six inches. So we came up with a list of criteria for each species to be included on this list. First, it had never been collected in Plum Creek. Second, it's found in abundance in adjacent waters to Plum Creek. So these are fish that would have likely migrated right back up into the stream when the water chemistry improved. Uh, third, it's got the ability to increase the IBI score, which is your fish metric there. And the table to the right shows all the positive attributes to the 12 metrics of that IBI. So these fish are going to bring that IBI score significantly when they establish their, their population there. And their spawning and habitat preferences are available in Plum Creek. We, I mentioned we take our habitat evaluation index scores, and we did a literature review of what these fish need to spawn, and the habitat is there for them to be able to spawn successfully. And these are not just real high quality fish. These are just typical fish found in other West Branch headwater streams. So next we, get, we came up with a plan all source locations where we're going to gather these fish from are going to be from within the Rocky River watershed. We're not trying to transfer them beyond watershed boundaries. And our goal is to put a minimum of 200 fish of each species in the stream per year at two seed locations, which you see here to the right. We're going to carry this project out for three years because it's the multiple years doing it. It reduces your uh, environmental variability of a bad spawning year, or weather year that could wipe the fish out increases your genetic diversity and increases the number of fish you put into the stream, therefore increases your chance of success. All translocation of these fish is gonna be done in the spring before they spawn, because when you concentrate these fish in two areas that have good habitat, you're more likely to have a successful project. Every fish that we translocate into Plum Creek will have a tag, a visual implant elastomer, which I'll get to in a minute, and then we're going to perform a fall sampling of the stream, which will be coming up here in the next month, just to see how they're doing within Plum Creek. So as I mentioned, we're tagging each fish. This is basically a two-part epoxy mix that a company sells that you mix it. You have an hour and a half to work with it. We'll put it into a little insulin syringe and inject the fish right underneath their skin. It doesn't harm the fish at all. They're real happy on the bottom picture here, swimming around. So for 2021, we used a pink stripe. So two, three years down the road, we can tell if a fish is still there with the pink stripe. It's happy in the stream. It's living there for multiple years. Their survivability rate's really good. And we can determine recruitment. So that's the successful spawn immediately upon sampling in the fall. So since none of these fish have been collected in Plum Creek before, Every fish that we collect that does not have one of these tags in it is going to be documented as one of the offspring of one of the fish we put in there. We can also document movement throughout the stream. I mentioned we had two seed locations. So one seed location is going to be tagged on the right side of their body and the other location will be tagged on the left side. So we can determine if these fish are moving around and colonizing the entire stream reach. So as for progress, all of our study plan and permitting was done in, this, in the winter time. So we were actually, be, we actually got this project started in March. We wanted to start early because a lot of the darters begin to spawn early March and um, April. We wanted to get them in the stream before they spawn. And we had a lot of help with this project as well. Brian Zimmerman, he works at the Ohio State University Museum of Biological Diversity. And he's also a co-author of one of the Fishes of Ohio books. He's done some of these projects in other parts of Ohio, but they're mostly with trying to expand fish whose range has been suppressed by dams. So he was a real good help on this project. We worked with Ohio State University students, as you can see in the picture here. And then we also had approval and support from the Ohio EPA who proposed the project, the Division of Wildlife and Cleveland Metro Parks. Justin, one more question. So I know we've gotten calls before, um, you know, when lakes or basins have been drained about relocating fish and if we can relocate fish were there permits that you had to get to move these fish from one location to another location yeah good question so we do have to get permits for this this is not just something anybody can do we have a permit that we have every year for our biological work which is a, a wildlife permit so we can collect these fish and hold on to them ohio division of wildlife uh, gives us that 
And for this project specifically, we had to get a permit to translocate native non-sport not native non-sport fish from the Division of Wildlife as well. And we sent the 20 page study plan over to them. They reviewed it all. They gave us the approval and wanted updates on it. Okay, thanks. So as for more progress, here's the table here on the left of all the fish that we were able to collect, tag and translocate into Plum Creek. Uh, we had a pretty good year. Our goal was 200 fish per species, which we met on six of the nine of them. So of total 3,367 fish were collected and moved into Plum Creek this year. Some fish were easier to collect than others. I think we learned a lot this year and we're gonna try to keep this progress moving forward. So bringing this, this tagging of the fish and translocation back to the overall goals is to achieve full biological attainment and eliminate the need to, uh, for an aquatic life use redesignation to a lower water quality goal. So the table here on the right shows basically our assessment from September 4th of 2020, where we have a poor fish community and a score of 20, 20 or of 22. And then we simulated a bioassessment, just adding typical numbers you'd find in other headwater streams to that assessment. So we're not changing that community, we're just adding these fish to it. We were able to bring that score up to a 46, which is very good. You need a 36 to be in attainment. We're shooting a little bit high just because this is a really a pilot project for the state. The table on the left here shows we now have full attainment of our IBI, which is the fish metric. We have an ICI, a macroinvertebrate metric of 34, which is already in attainment. And we're hoping for the first time ever, we can have a full biological attainment in Plum Creek. If we do that, we can enhance water quality and drive protection for Plum Creek and possibly do this project on other streams within our service area. In terms of other streams, Plum Creek was really our project to start out with. We're hoping to move it to other, pro or to other streams within the service area. Here's a list of a few. Abram Creek has the Hopkins Airport and a couple of dams downstream. Beecher's Brook has a dam on it at Mayfield Road. Blodgett Creek may be the next one we try. Again, we're going to see how this works three years down the road, but here's a small little fish barrier here. I believe this goes under the Turnpike over by Sprague Road in uh, Berea. But even a little drop structure like this can limit fish passage upstream. Anybody have any questions, comments on it? I know it's a lot to take in. If there's no questions, then I'll hand it off to George Remius, Manager of Stormwater Strategic Support. Thank you, Justin. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So my presentation, I'm gonna cover two primary topics. One is you've heard us talk about our urgent storm event response in the past and primarily a lot of the steps that we take. This is more of a focus on the type of data that we collect, some of the analysis we uh, conduct and how we use that to support our field response and post-storm event analysis. The second one then, as uh, Frank had mentioned at the very beginning, uh, is how we're using some of these stormwater uh, master plan models and extending them into the local system to support some of the local flooding issues and, and looking for regional benefits. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of data that we collect and um, I'm gonna highlight a few of those here today. Um, the first one is uh, the rainfall data. So we have 40 district rain gauges. We actually added the 40th one earlier this year over our West Lee treatment plant. And that collects five minute time step data um, every day of the year. And we use that data to help identify different uh, heavy rainfall and high intensity events um, throughout the year. And then in addition to that, we also have a gauge adjusted radar rainfall data contract that covers actually a little over 1,300 square miles of the area that drains within our service area or area that drains into our service area. The figure that you see there on the right kind of gives you an idea of that coverage of the area um, and the different types of rainfall that we can um, summarize with it 
The orange dots on the figure represent some of the stream monitors that we have with the USGS. Uh, we have roughly 40, um, little almost 40 stream monitors from the USGS in there, uh, 80 monitors total between ours, um, the districts, and uh, an external vendor that's investing in some monitoring. And then we also uh, have trail cams as well. And the trail cams, we have nearly 20 of those. And we use those to help us with um, capturing photos of where there may be flooding, debris, or erosion. Next slide, please. So to talk about the district rain gauges, um, this is something when we have a decent storm event, uh, we're able to very quickly uh, collect the data and then quickly analyze it into a series of different time steps. And we look at these different time steps you see here on the left, this table of the different rain gauges. And then for the different columns, there's the different durations of rainfall. And we compare our rainfall data to two different references. There's the Huff and Angel series uh, from 1990 that collected data and translated the different depths of rainfall into recurrence intervals from two month up to the 100 year. And then we also have the NOAA Atlas 14 reference that was published in 2004 that does the same durations, but then uh, looks at that rainfall from the one year to a thousand year. And so with the data that we collect, uh, we can quickly do the quick analysis and determine where we might have heavy rainfall which is something I kind of use as roughly two inches or more, um, or high intensity um, rainfall, where if the peak intensity was an inch per hour or more. So looking at this table here on the left, if you use an example, the Westlake rain gauge on the very bottom kind of indicates from a peak intensity, which would be that five minute to peak one hour was very mild. Um, whereas for the heavy rainfall for the peak 12 hour and 24 hour, it was closer to a five-year recurrence interval indicating that there was some heavy rainfall. The figure on the left or on the right shows the cumulative rainfall totals for all the different rain gauges and compares that to the 24-hour um, recurrence intervals of the NOAA Atlas 14. And you can see for this particular storm event that the West Lake rain gauge had exceeded the five-year 24-hour and then some of the other rain gauges, the Easterly, Olmstead Falls, Wade Park, North Olmstead rain gauges also compiled decent storm amounts. So we use these to help us identify areas that we might want to conduct a field response. Next slide, please. So in addition to the district rain gauges, this uh, gauge adjusted radar rainfall that we use, um, we also do the same type of analysis for the same durations, but for a bigger coverage area um, to help us better understand how extensive the rain um, was throughout the area and how that might be leading to a potential flooding that we would conduct a field response. So the figure here on the right, this just shows for one of those, uh, for the coverage area, uh, this was the July 12th event from earlier this year. Uh, gives you a quick snapshot on where you might have had peak intensity. Uh, and this is the 30 minute duration. And some of the areas where you see it's, it's clear was an insignificant amount. And as it got to the different colors that you see in the legend, the darker the color um, or closer to pink, the more infrequent it was. That area that's kind of on the West End, which got as a little bit of the orange grids, indicated a decent amount of rainfall. And that just so happens to be in Plum Creek that Justin just talked to you about. And we have a USGS rain or stream monitor in there. And this figure that you see here in the upper left kind of indicates the different, um, how high the water was. And you can see in a couple instances that it reached the action stage or the flood stage, which is a sign that we would uh, conduct a field response in that area. Next slide, please. So with the, those stream monitors, I mentioned there was roughly 80 of them. Um, what we're trying to do is I'm a big fan of the National Weather Service uh, flood stages. You can see those on the bottom left there. There's four of them, action, minor, moderate flooding, and major flooding. Action stage kind of indicates that the stream is about to get out of its banks. Minor flooding suggests that there may have been a local row that was flooded. Moderate flooding kind of indicates that there might have been uh, some type of 
building inundation in addition to some of the road inundation, whereas major flooding indicates roughly a, an entire neighborhood or a lot of buildings and a lot of roads have been inundated. So as we try and define those National Weather Service equivalent stages for all 80 of those monitors, when we get the stages defined, um, same thing that we do with the rainfall data, we use those to have indications of where there may have been some type of flooding. The table here on the right shows you some of those different monitors and uh, what was the current stage when we collected the data, what was the peak stage at the, uh, over the course of the event, and what was the peak National Weather Service flood stage status that it reached. So there's a couple of those, the Plum Creek and the West Branch, Rocky River, where it had exceeded the action stage. And those are indications that we would send crews out to do a field response as well. Next slide. We also have a little over 20 different trail cams scattered throughout the service area. And a lot of these we put into some of these remote areas or flood prone areas or debris prone areas to assist us uh, for field response and also to help us indicate where or uh, figure out where we might need to send contractors to do debris maintenance. Figure on the left is where the airport debris rack is, is located. You can see on July 12th, this captured a photo where the water had actually gone over the top of the debris rack. And you can see the debris that was piling up behind it. And we would conduct a response here uh, to send our maintenance contractor out there to clean that. The figure on the right is during the September 23rd event. You can see with this photo how high the debris did re get. And this also would trigger a response for our maintenance contractor to clean it up. And these are these kind of photos we can compile and actually turn into the equivalent of a video that helps better understand the type of inundation and what happened during that storm. Next slide, please. So in addition to those data sources, once we uh, asked for some field response, some of those field observation, some of the sediment debris accumulation, all the different rainfall and monitoring data we mentioned, as well as customer media, customer media reports, we compile all that and we try and conduct a different type of analysis to better understand what happened and uh, what to do about it. So I mentioned a little bit about the rainfall statistics that we compile based upon the different information. And then we also try and compare um, with our models, what would the models have predicted for that particular event compared to what actually flooded and see if there was a good correlation there. Um, and we're also then trying to compile what happened after a storm event and comparing it to other storms so we can see if there's some types of correlations between the flooding and debris accumulation, which uh, sometime we might need to present at one of these WAC meetings. So just a reminder um, for those of you who use the report of flood tool that Donna brought up, the more information that we're aware of what flooded, the better it is for us on our field response and with our models, which leads into the second topic. So now that the master plans are wrapping up and the different stormwater models are being presented or being provided to us, we're also trying to make sure that those reflect existing conditions and all of our recommended alternatives as we move from planning to design, eventually to construction. And so those models that we have, they're available for communities to use to support their own local stormwater evaluations. And at times, the district gets requested to assist with some of their local issues. And um, we, when we get involved, we're always looking to help look for opportunities for the regional benefits. The figure on the right kind of shows you um, in the shaded areas, the different areas that we do have stormwater models. Um, and the black boundary kind of indicates where we have that uh, interaction between our combined sewer models and our stormwater models. Next slide, please. So one of those examples that we got um, asked for assistance with, with the city of Brook Park in their Kalita Ditch area. And so the city of Brook Park asked for some assistance. And as we started looking into this, the background with the city of Brook Park here was it was a very heavily developed area, um, post-World War II area, era in the 50s and 60s. The drainage area itself 
is about four square miles, but over two miles of that is impervious area. At the time in the 50s and 60s, there are very few stormwater management regulations. Um, and so as a result, many of the stormwater control measures required today uh, were not implemented. Most of the storm sewers in that area um, that were constructed in the 50s and 60s still remain. And this area, um, which is unique to Northeast Ohio, also has common trenches uh, where both the storm sewer and the sanitary are, are in the same trench, a little different than the combined or the separate trenches today. Um, but it's not the only community that has that. And built in, being built in the 50s and 60s, many of those storm sewers don't meet today's standards and are getting close to the end of their useful life. Next slide, please. So just to show you the difference in how quickly this area was developed, uh, the picture on the left shows you an aerial of what the city looked like back in 1951. You can kind of see the darker area um, where there was very little development. And less than two decades later, just more how developed the area did um, become. And uh, most of that area, you can tell, was developed within that period of time. So all the storm sewers, all the infrastructure to support that population were built at that time. Next slide, please. So, but um, just to highlight, you know, we're focusing here on the city of Brook Park, but their challenges are not unique. Um, in fact, are very similar to the challenges that in most of the communities in our service area. So this graphic here um, indicates just how much of the population of Ohio um, had occurred historically and compares that to the stormwater management regulations over the decades. And you can see on this figure that a little over 10 million of the population of Ohio existed back in 1980. And that's typically when infrastructure is built to support the population. And when you compare that to the types of stormwater management regulations you see on the bottom, whether it's for pipe sizing for capacity purposes, floodplain regulations, stormwater control measures, uh, very little existed prior to 1980, which is really when things started to require a, a higher capacity for storm sewers, FEMA um, flood control requirements, um, stream setbacks, um, stormwater control measures for flood control and water quality volume. So just with that in mind, it just shows you just how common this challenge really was. Next slide, please. So going back to the city of Brook Park on how do we get involved from the modeling side, um, they're very cooperative and open to all sorts of ideas on how to solve the problems. And as a result, what we realized is some of the problems that they were looking to solve in the local system required a lot more additional detail to the model than we originally had before. So you can see the table on the right has the number of modeled catchments and what was changed um, as part of this um, extension into the local system. So there was roughly 76 catchments at the time. Now there's over a thousand. The average catchment size is relatively good at 33 acres, but it was reduced down to the catch basin level on the residential and to the parcel level for the non-residential for the types of solutions that we are trying to uh, consider as part of this um, evaluation. And then the number of modeled conduits and the total conduit length, one time was a little over 50,000 in the area and it was expanded to nearly 250,000 feet as part of this uh, expansion. Next slide, please. So to help kind of better explain what all that means, the figure on the left shows you the catchment delineations, the hydrologic catchment delineation for the master plan. Um, once again, it was a good level of detail, but what um, has been the update as part of this evaluation is shown on the right, really with the focus of making sure we understood um, at the catch basin level or the parcel level, um, how the area is being drained and uh, more or less set up to assist with some of the solutions. Next slide. Similar to the hydrology changes, the slide on the left gives you an example of what were the hydraulic model um, segments in this area on the left. 
and uh, the updates to the right, which really pretty much there was really good record keeping of the available storm sewers. And um, as a result, took just about every drawing that had the dimensions and shape and sizes and inverts and uh, ultimately added that into the model to assist with this evaluation. Next slide. So we're at this stage where there's a few different monitors in this area, um, collecting data to assist with model calibration, as well as collecting some of the information from the report of flood tool. And once the model's calibrated, the next step is going to be um, looking into stormwater control measure solutions. Most of that, uh, as I mentioned before, is because there was challenges with the imperviousness. Uh, it's a very flat area. Um, it's less than half a percent on average, 0.2% uh, in most places. And the soils um, are very relatively impervious, uh, very poor draining soils. So the solutions here are really focused more on the stormwater control measures since we don't want to just uh, pass the problems downstream. So with the storage control measures that we're exploring, there's the conventional where it'd be more inline, but in order for that to be successful, you need to have enough elevation difference between the upstream and downstream in order for that ponding to not cause problems upstream. Then we're also looking into the conventional offline detention, but you would have to have enough space in order to divert all that storage into that area, which sometimes becomes challenging with an area as built out as this. And then the third type is really more of a decentralized where we're looking at underground storage, particularly in um, non-residential or within the public right away, which is a relatively new concept. Um, and that is something that we're gonna be investing in here um, once the model is updated. So once this is completed, um, this might be a good topic to bring up to others um, at the next WAC meeting. Next slide. So this is just a picture of the Kalita ditch, the very upstream extent and where all some of these storm sewers actually discharge. Um, but I will take any questions. If no questions, then I will hand it off to uh, Rachel Webb, I believe, who is going to give an update on the um, master plans. Thank you, George. Afternoon. Um, so what you have up here on the screen, right, is something you might have seen before. Just a quick summary of uh, what the results were from the Cuyahoga River North Stormwater Master Plan. Uh, a number of problem areas, 70 plus, right? Um, more, you know, just over half a million dollars in construction costs um, that were captured as part of this uh, master planning process. Uh, community reports were distributed in 2020 um, by the watershed team leaders, so Donna, and then depending on who your primary is, Jeff or Myring. Um, if you have not had a chance to look over them and this jogs your memory and something to put on your to-do list, please don't hesitate to follow up with the team leader and uh, we can answer any questions you may have, go over any problem areas, uh, address any questions, like I said, from the results here. Uh, next slide. With that being said, we are putting these plans to use. Um, they are have been an excellent source in what we're basing a lot uh, the stormwater construction plan off of. So all the problem areas that were identified in the master plan were nominated through the stormwater construction plan, ranked, scored, or scored and ranked, right, in order. Um, and so we're starting to address those. Here you just have a couple of examples of um, projects that were pulled from a larger problem area. So that's the ID there, the BCNR02, that's the problem area ID. 
And uh, from that problem area, we pulled a smaller project, um, which is the Sprague Road project, which is starting construction next year. Um, we have another, we have a, a couple in Big Creek here that are going on, um, but you can see there is movement um, and there are, we are putting these plans to excellent use and all the information and recommendations that they provided. Next slide. With that being said, um, there are some problem areas that we needed to take another, uh, a more detailed look at to get them to a point where we can move them into a design project. This here is an example of what we've done with advanced stormwater planning contracts that we have. This was a large problem area. Uh, you can go to the next slide. That um, when you looked at it was, had 20 different components, it had a $36 million price tag. And so we needed to look at how we could make that smaller manageable projects that we could um, start to move through and phase through uh, over time. Next slide. So we started that advanced planning project um, and the results have um, been coming in here uh, this fall. We took that large problem area and we broke it up into six phases or six components. And in doing that, we looked at each of those components or phases and the benefit that each one provided um, to the regional system and those buildings, roads, and or utilities that were impacted or were benefiting from that particular phase. And we went through and found the best sequence to maximize the benefits up front for each one of those. So if you go to the next slide, you can see here, this is just a table of the scenario that worked and was optimal and, and more often than not, right? This is gonna be upstream to downstream and this is what you have here. I know there's a, a lot here on this slide, but you can see the green numbers and you can kind of move down and that would be the phase. So you have existing conditions. And so you see the hundred year and the number of buildings on the left. And then to the right, you have the number of road segments. Um, and as you move down through the phases, those numbers begin to fall. And that's what we wanted to see. And you'll see the largest jump, right? Is in those first couple of phases. I think it's important to note here so that um, the Stearns Farm and the conveyance improvements are two pieces um, that uh, are recommended to be done very close to each other um, in phasing because they one is very much dependent on the success of the other. So that's why there you don't see a huge drop or a huge change in the benefits in terms of building and transportation segments. Um, however, it is still there. So that's just some of what we're seeing from advanced planning. And I think it's been um, very happy with the results. And so we now have this large problem area that is gonna be broken down into these um, five, six phases over time that we can implement. And these are gonna be projects that are gonna somewhere around $5 million, uh, maybe up to eight, but trying to stay in that 5 million area, if not lower, so that, um, uh, we can have multiple projects right across the service area at one time. 36 million is not something that we could do all at once, which was originally the, the problem area total. So, so that's just one of the advanced planning problem areas uh, that we're looking at. Uh, with that, we are um, continuing with advanced planning and we'll have a second contract um, that we'll be letting here uh, at the end of October. Um, that'll go for four years. So um, continue to do work on uh, these problem areas where needed. So uh, that is all I have. If you wanna go to the next slide, just a quick snippet of what's going on um, and how we're using what we've uh, received from master planning and, and working in through advanced planning. Any questions? I don't see any, so I'm gonna pass it on. I think hopefully to Nikki, I think the network issues have been worked out at EMSC. Uh, yes, can you hear me, Rachel? I can, so go right ahead. Alrighty, terrific. Yeah, we did um, lose internet here at EMSC and I'm just connected to a hotspot. So I actually don't know about everybody else. Um, so, okay, let's see, wait, um, is, my com is my camera not working? 
Hmm. There we go. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, hi everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to give you a quick update about our inspection and maintenance program and our demolition uh, services. Although I am a little tempted to go on because I do see we have about a half hour to go until our meeting ends. I'm just joking. All right, so this is our title. Uh, this title slide is actually a great segue from Rachel's presentation. Uh, this is an 11 foot high bank on an outer meander um, with a, within a flood prone residential neighborhood in Parma. So this drop off was actually uh, 25 feet from a house, um, which we required uh, demolished and then restored the property. Uh, this property is included in one of the stormwater master plans uh, recommendations um, to reduce uh, threats to infrastructure, um, BTU such as a house and uh, floodplain expansion. So this is perfect. All right, next slide. Thanks. Um, so since the beginning of the year, um, we actually uh, inspected 387 assets. I looked at the number this morning um, and uh, that's all within the Cuyahoga River North uh, watershed. And uh, 285 of those were inspected in-house by our swim team. And the remaining 100 uh, were completed by other responsible parties. And uh, that's, you know, such as the county, ODOT, Metro Parks um, and the railroad companies. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, SWIM performed a routine follow-up uh, just a little over a month ago for erosion adjacent to an apartment complex. Um, the erosion had not been significantly uh, progressing during recent inspections. So this was a surprise to find this during this inspection. Uh, actually, a sanitary sewer had collapsed. Um, so a dye test confirmed that the stream was actually infiltrating the sanitary sewer, potentially you know, causing um, pipe capacity issues and water quality issues. Uh, because it's a locally owned sewer, the city is working with the county on a temporary fix. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a stormwater master plan recommendation for this specific um, sanitary sewer. And that's just really because it wasn't exposed at the time that they were conducting their survey. Um, but because there is uh, numerous um, utilities along this open stream channel in Mill Creek, the sewer district is going to reevaluate the area for uh, potentially a long-term solution. Uh, John, next slide. Thank you. Uh, this right bank, this uh, picture is um, of a right bank slope failure. Um, it's actually exposed the building footer and was beginning to scour underneath um, the concrete pathway, exactly where a downspout was located. Um, there's actually a few downspouts that drain directly onto the slope and uh, we, we believe are likely contributors to the failure. Uh, this channelized stream is also included in one of our stormwater master plan problem areas uh, for floodplain expansion and about 610 feet of stream restoration directly behind the shopping plaza. So um, until design and construction take place in the future, um, maintenance did extend the downspout um, that was exactly where the footers being exposed and did place um, some temporary stream bank protection at both of the downspouts that we were concerned about. Uh, next slide, please. Um, stormwater maintenance. So um, along with stream inspections, we also inspect uh, all crossings and culverts within our regional system. Uh, this is a double barrel crossing, Arch CMP, um, just south of Wilson Mills Road. And um, it's, you know, a CMP, so it's, it's usual that we find um, compression, such as in this one. Um, it's got, ex it's exhibiting heavy rust um, and scaling throughout. Um, it's got extensive uh, section loss at the invert. And um, you can kind of see here that the, the invert has been, it's basically ripped up and upheaving uh, where it's then causing debris to accumulate. So of course, maintenance went out and removed it. And when crossings like this are in poor condition, we do always send out uh, our inspection report to the owner and to their city. All right, move on to uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. 
So for this year, our maintenance has completed 49 projects uh, within the Cuyahoga River North Watershed. Um, the term um, other that you see on the screen, that's attributed to demolitions, uh, small scale projects and tree removal projects. And uh, we don't typically, um, you know, we don't promote removing live trees, but the only time that we do is if it's leaning at a greater than 45 degree angle and that all of their roots are exposed and it's potentially threatening infrastructure such as like a garage, a house, um, utility line. So just wanna clear that up. All right, next, next slide, please. Well, many of you might recognize this uh, basin. This is Karush Stormwater Detention Basin. Our contractor recently removed a thousand cubic yards of sediment um, to uh, restore active storage volume here. Uh, this basin is regularly maintained for both sediment and debris accumulation after storm events. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, a critical part of our program is the acquisition of properties that are needed for uh, implementing uh, the stormwater projects. So earlier this year, our department um, took on demolition services um, for these properties. Um, this includes an asbestos survey, possible abatement, then removing all structures, including the foundation, swimming pools, decks, hot tubs, um, septic tanks, um, and then finally restoring the property. So um, this photo you see here is actually um, was our uh, first pilot project, our pilot demo that we did in early spring. This is in Gates Mills, uh, Pepper Pike. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? And this is a picture of um, one that we did in, uh, in Seven Hills. So, and just yesterday, we actually demolished a third home in um, North Royalton on Maple Grove off of uh, Thornhurst. So we have an additional uh, four demolitions, demolition projects in the works, and we've completed three so far. So uh, that's all I've got for you. I'm glad to answer any questions you may have. Well, um, if there's no questions, then next up, uh, last but not least, is Tony Calvich. He is our stormwater construction manager. Thanks, Nicole. Sure. All right, so next we'll be talking about the stormwater design and construction program. We'll give you some highlights of our uh, design program, things we have in the works right now. Um, this project is a flood reduction project near Sprague Road. It's in North Royalton and Parma. If you look on the right side of the screen, you'll see some pictures. Um, one is a, a culvert that we'll need to upsize to get water conveyed um, under the road. The picture below it is at the downstream end of the project. It's uh, some walls that channelize the flow. Um, so the project required us to acquire two uh, parcels and uh, demolish the structures there in order to install a stream corridor going through, through where those parcels are. Um, there should be a lot of planting and green space created here so that the stream can access its uh, floodplains that we're gonna build. This project, West Creek Stabilization, this is in Brooklyn Heights. It's a rather large project for us, uh, estimated 16.7 million currently. Um, if you see the deer in the uh, top picture there, they're standing on, seems to be a small waterfall, but it's also a fish passage impediment. So we'll be uh, raising the stream bed here so that there isn't a fish passage impediment. The other picture on the right-hand side of the screen is a flume or a concrete channel. That's a, and it's a structural failure, I think is the term for that, but uh, we'll be doing a stream rehabilitation through this entire reach. $7 million came from the US EPA and another 2 million from ODOT um, to help with the stabilization in this area. We're also gonna do some culvert replacement um, along Pepper Loose Creek in the city of Pepper Pike. If you look at the right hand side of the screen picture, you obviously see the, uh, the road is flooding and uh, there are some culverts failing in this area that need to be replaced. 
They're using some community cost share here for the rehabilitation on the upstream culvert. Um, this is a $2.2 million project we have in the works in uh, design right now to reduce flooding at the Gates Mill Boulevard. Uh, we're starting to get into this next project also, which is culvert streams rehabilitation. This one in particular is along Mill Creek. Culverted streams are pipes that run underground that carry stream flow beneath the city or beneath an asset. Um, there are three of them here we're looking at uh, rehabilitating um, through various methodologies. We'll, we'll look at uh, linings and replacement, daylighting, whatever we need to look at. We'll do proper alternatives analysis, to see what's the most cost-effective and effective solution. Uh, this project in particular, totaling $1.5 million, um, and on the next slide, you'll see an, an, a list of more culverted streams. There are culverted streams throughout the district um, that we're analyzing and budgeting to spend $1.5 million every year rehabilitating culverted streams that carry these natural flows beneath the city. We've built so much infrastructure on top of stream corridor that rehabilitation needs to be done to carry these flows. Any questions about our design, things we have in design? If not, we'll move on to talking about things currently under construction. Um, this is a recently uh, completed project in the city of North Royalton. This is a tributary to the Rocky River and you can't quite see the Rocky River in this picture, but it's it's right there on the other side of the picture, just downstream. The before picture on the left hand side shows how close this stream had gotten to um, Ridge Road. You can see the uh, guardrail failing. Okay, and so a typical construction method would be to install some sort of wall next to the road that would protect the road from the vicious stream, but uh, Instead, we decided we would move the stream away and give, give it its proper birth, its proper area, let it access a floodplain. We've seen a couple storms come through this project already, and the hydraulic modeling on the design side was correct, and it seems to flow through this path. You see a sinuous path we've created and access its floodplains. And so I think we've put a sustainable solution next to this road, giving each its proper um, birth its proper space the stream needs its own space and so does the road so hopefully they can uh, live together here happily together so another project we recently uh, hit substantial or will hit substantial completion on is this uh pepper loose creek stabilization near lander road this is also in the city of pepper pike um, on the left hand side of the screen, you see the before picture, very channelized um, flow going through this area. We did acquire one parcel and demolish one residential structure in order to, again, give the stream its proper birth, its proper flow path. We've widened out the channel, we've let it access floodplains, and so hopefully we'll be able to uh, stay here. And uh, you can also see the very green established corridor through the area that we are requiring in our construction contracts that there's a germination period after the construction is complete where um, contractors are being held to germination rates and establishing this green corridor as designed. And I think that will aid in uh, developing successful projects and turning them over to be properly maintained in the future. That being said, this picture is another completed project, Stickney Creek restoration. We uh, moved a, a sewer out of the stream and the stream away from the sewer, giving both of them space. And it seems to be very uh, happy now with all its plantings and there's usually deer out there. So uh, our methods are working and I think our completed projects will continue to tell that story. Thanks, Tony. Any questions? I see. Hearing none. Okay. Well, um, a couple of in-house announcements before I close out uh, this webinar that we've been having. The first, um, uh, congratulations to uh, Frank Greenland. He won the Lifetime Achievement Award here at the Sewer District. It's 
quite a big deal. So thank you, Frank, for your leadership. Um, and then Mark Link, our fearless leader um, from Stormwater Inspection and Maintenance, our manager, he will be retiring in November. I'm sure he is very sad that this will be one of his last WAC meetings. Um, so thank you to Mark for uh, helping us all out um, and being with the program from the start. With that, um, I will close this out. If you have any questions, feel free to email your watershed team leader, um, me, Myring, or Jeff, and have a nice afternoon. Thank you.